and good evening everybody. Uh, well, I'm delighted to uh, once again be welcoming to the seminar my uh, Historic England colleague, Alan Brodie. Uh, it, it feels like only yesterday you were last addressing us, Alan, after a much uh, postponed uh, talk on uh, England's seaside heritage, a romp no less through England's seaside heritage brought last summer's seminar program to a close. Um, but today we are uh, we uh, be we will be hearing on a different building type, possibly one you might become acquainted with if your jolly boys outing to Margate seaside goes a bit awry. And uh, we will hear more of Alan's one of his other uh, sort of areas of, of research interest, which is um, the architecture of, of prisons and incarceration. Um, uh, a long-standing research interest, a couple of large monographs produced around the turn of the of the century behind bars, a secret architecture of uh, English prisons and English prisons, uh, uh, an architectural history. Um, uh, Alan will be, will be bringing us up to date with his research, uh, with his paper uh, this evening, which is uh, entitled New Ideas, New Buildings, Same Old Porridge, uh, England's 20th Century Prison Architecture. So if you're ready and raring to go, Alan, I, I pass over to you. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, sorry, I'm just getting all my technology ducks in a row. Um, the, 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 the seaside research and the prison research are, are actually sort of uh, inextricably linked because after five years of working on prisons, I needed a long holiday and I spent the next 20 years at the seaside. So um, the two do have some sort of synergy. Um, what I want to talk about today is, is 20th century prison buildings and the great variety of, of thinking behind them in the course of the 20th century. The previous centuries, the 18th and 19th century, had seen a series of reforms that created a substantial system of local prisons, convict prisons, a few military prisons, and institutions such as Broadmoor's Criminal Lunatic Asylum. A series of reforms in the type of regime used in prisons had established the thing called the separate system in the mid 19th century. Uh, this was a system based on inmates spending time alone and in silence in individual cells, 23 hours a day, or even a bit longer than that. This system was modified at various times in subsequent decades with greater emphasis being placed on communal working and less time in cells. Nevertheless, the typical Victorian cell block remained the standard form in use throughout the country alongside some repurposed Georgian buildings. And so this is the classic prison block you see in all sorts of films and television shows of the open landings, this sort of central open atrium, a bit like the nave of a, of a great church. Throughout recent history, there's been a belief in the inexorable rise of crime. Crime is always on the way up, um, allegedly, and therefore prison numbers were always increasing. But for the first part of my talk tonight, the first decades of the 20th century, crime may or may not have been rising, but prisoner numbers were low and stable. And there's no better way to start a talk with a nice table of figures. Um, this is the populations on the left hand side at various times, uh, the population of England and Wales, and the approximate population in each of the accompanying years. So you can see in 1881, England and Wales 26 million with a prison population of 40,000. By the time you get to 1931, the population of England and Wales is at 40 million, but there are only 10,000 people in prison. So there's a, few, a little bit extra in military prisons, I think, but essentially basically just 10,000 people. Uh, last year, the population of England was estimated to be, England and Wales was estimated to be around 60 million, with a prison population of 79,000. If we add another table, uh, sort of column to the table, the number of prisons has changed dramatically over the same period. In 1877, there were 113 prisons, and they were run by cities or towns and by counties. 1878, 1st of April, they were nationalised, and the new prison commission that took them over cut the number of prisons. There were so many unsuitable ones, and we are left with 69. And then if you follow down through the years, the, the figures show you that, say, by 1929, we've reached a, a point where essentially there are 10,000 people in prison. 
and uh, only 31 prisons still open. A lot of Victorian prisons actually shut in the 20s and 30s, only to be reopened, I'll mention that briefly, um, after the Second World War. But then from 1940 onwards, the figures have been on the rise until recent years when we've flatlined around about the 80,000 mark. Um, and you can see accompanying the rise in prisoner number, offender numbers, a great increase in the number of prisons. So that in 2021, we now have 117 prisons. And just to accompany a nice graph, and you can see this is the local prison population, which is the vast majority of inmates. You can see beginning on the left hand side at 1978, uh, sorry, 1878. And then the middle low part is literally between the two world wars between 1916, 18 and 1940, where the figures bob along at around 10,000. And then you start this, this inexorable rise from 1940. Uh, and as I say, it's only in recent years that it's sort of leveled out around the 80,000 mark. The result of having falling prisoner numbers and then stable, relatively low numbers meant that prison administrators could start to think more creatively and more innovatively about prisons and prison regimes. At the end of the 19th century, they'd begun to create specialised institutions for categories of offender, including the notorious inebriate woman. And by the beginning of the 20th century, their attention was turning to providing specialised accommodation for young offenders and hardened criminals. And this is a, a photograph of one of the cell blocks at Rochester, the famous uh, Borstal, the, the prison that gave its name to that sort of type of young person's uh, institution. The 1908 Prevention of Crime Act had set up this form of specialist prison for young offenders. Uh, and it was based on a life based on military discipline and intensive training to help with their rehabilitation. This was thought to be a positive thing at the beginning of the 20th century, but by the 1980s, the word Borstal would have very negative connotations. But originally it was thought to be a positive weapon in the fight against crime and reoffending. The 1908 Prevention of Crime Act also led to the construction of Camp Hill for habitual offenders. Um, and both had a similar kind of philosophy in their design. Building work started at Camp Hill. This is on, sorry, I should have said that's on the Isle of Wight um, in 1909 to 10. And the prison had opened by March 1912, although work was still carrying on in sight in 1914 to 15. A description of the newly opened but as yet unfinished prison uh, in 1912 emphasised its pleasant surroundings. I will quote, what may be called a garden village is being built, and as the site is on sloping ground in the forest, the grouping of white and red and white single, double and four cottage blocks amongst the trees will give a most pleasing effect when completed. So they're, they're picking up, riffing on that theme of the garden village, like, uh, which is what, sort of a big idea at the beginning of the 20th century. The administration building boasted a veranda and there was a chapel there that looked like a small country church, but grouped around, sort of the, so they were around the sort of central open area and also around it were a series of single and two-storied buildings. Cell blocks, uh, had two stories and contained about 50 cells. But um, although it's obviously a prison, prison, they did contain slightly more domestic features. So if you look at the cells, um, they contained originally six panel doors and sash windows. The regime was designed to be less rigorous than an, in an ordinary prison. And inmates could effectively move through the the years that they spent in this prison um, and get extra privileges. The, the purpose of this prison was to take hardened offenders, people who had effectively done the three strikes, the equivalent three strikes, and give them this additional sentence, which is very much based on rehabilitation and, and training them up to be fit citizens. So they would begin their sentence in an ordinary grade, but after two years of model behavior and hard work, they could go to the special grade and they would get extra privileges like newspapers and tobacco. Um, those who were within two years of conditional discharge and who'd proved themselves suitably 
well behaved while in the prison, were eligible for a halfway house between the prison and the outside world. And this was situated outside the walls, but within the pr prison grounds. And these parole lines, as they were called, were a group of 16 self-contained tenements, each with a bed, sitting room, kitchen and lavatory. At the end of the sentence, preventive dente detainees were released on license into the care of the Central Association. So we're getting thinking now about the after effects of prison. And so the prison service is not just about locking them up them doing the sense being released they're trying to actively rehabilitate make them fit to be released back into society we come to the 1920s and a figure who would loom large in the story of 20th century prisons appears this is a man called alexander patterson in 1922 he was appointed um as uh, appointed to the prison commission and he became the vice chairman of the prison commission. This is the body, the government body that ran England's prisons. And he actually remained as vice chairman for 25 years until his death in 1947, always refusing to be promoted because he felt he could do more good being active as a vice chairman than being a chairman. He was an inspiring figure whose belief in Christianity and the English public school system combined to offer a new vision of imprisonment, building on the ideas that were already being used in the, the Borstal and at Camp Hill. He believed that prisons should not simply be a cloakroom or a kennel, but instead should have a positive impact on an offender's behaviour. An inmate's personality should be developed by imprisonment through an active daily programme that included both physical and mental stimulation, as well as, quote, humanising and socialising influences. To achieve this, he first concentrated on developing the ideas of the Borstal system by introducing extra features from public schools, including a feature such as housemasters to provide leadership. Uh, temper, you know, more leadership and sort of more sort of an authority figure for the, the young offenders. Patterson also began to envisage the creation of new open institutions, i.e. a prison without a wall or a fence around it. And he envisaged these being hutted camps where inmates would carry out work such as land reclamation, forest clearing or road building. By 1929, the Prison Commission had recognised the need to create a new Borstal, and they decided to create it as an open institution. They found a 340-acre site, Loudham Grange, which I think is Nottinghamshire area in the, centre, in the Midlands, um, and gathered together a group of boys at Feltham uh, Prison on the outskirts of London, ready for them setting off in May 1930 for the 132-mile march. And once they arrived there, they erected tents and they started to live there while they built wooden huts. Um, the prison at Loudham Grange no longer, uh, that prison doesn't exist anymore, but I'll, I'll show you the 20th century one uh, that's replaced it. During the 1930s, permanent accommodation was erected in the form of huts. Um, and the same sort of approach was taken in the creation of another um, institution for young offenders, this one at North Sea Camp, where young offenders from Stafford were marched across the country to the Lincolnshire coast to create this camp. Again, they lived in tents while they built their huts. And the purpose of this one was to uh, maintain and improve the existing sea bank that called the Roman Bank. And that is still a program that goes on today. North Sea Camp is not for young offenders anymore. It's actually for adult uh, inmates. And it's where Geoffrey Archer, I think, spent a large part of his prison sentence. All the prison's land on the seaside of this bank has been reclaimed by inmates. Um, and <clears throat> the aim in 1937 was to reclaim 600 acres of salt marsh. And what they were doing was they were buying salt marsh at three pounds an acre. And by the time they'd finished with the reclamation, it had become desirable farmland at £100 an acre. And over the time the, the prison's been running, they've, they've built 28 miles of dikes and now have claimed almost 1,000 acres, reclaimed 1,000 acres of salt marsh for farmland. So the initial thinking was that open conditions were suitable uh, for young offenders, but not necessarily for adults. But by 1931, 
um, a departmental committee had decided that they wanted to experiment with labour camps and minimum security structures. I know labour camps has a rather unfortunate co connotation, but by labour camps, they just meant an open institution where people would work, with, would, a place where people would live and work in that area. By August 1935, a small camp for 50 inmates had been established in the woods of West Yorkshire for use during the week. Um, so what would happen would inmates would come out of Wakefield, they would stay here at Woodhall, at Newhall, sorry, um, during the week and then go back to the prison at the weekend. And they used a number of old officers' huts from HMP Leeds um, and the site began to open in uh, November 1935. In 1936, it was officially declared a prison, although it was still treated administratively as a, a satellite of Wakefield uh, prison. Um, the issue of dealing with women offenders was also uh, rising up the agenda. In 1938, Lillian Barker was appointed the first female assistant commissioner uh, of the prison commission and she advocated the construction of a new purpose-built prison at Stanwell which would allow the women to be decanted out of Holloway jail um, and male prisoners would move in from Pentonville into Holloway and Pentonville would have been demolished. The plan which was only just in rough back of a bit of paper um, in 1938 was to create a series of semi-detached houses, each holding 25 women, and who were supervised in each house by a matron. On the campus there would be a chapel, a library and workrooms. Now, no prison's actually ever been built on this model, but coincidentally, as I will show you a little bit later, the late Victorian children's home at Style became a female prison in 1962 and employed exactly this kind of layout. So it'll give you some impression of what the vision was. To this end, the Prison Commission purchased Stanhope Farm at Stanwell on the 3rd of August 1939. Not great timing there, folks. But the impending war delayed the project, and in fact, the project never went ahead, and the site is now underneath a bit of Heathrow Airport. Much of this kind of enthusiastic reform programme uh, that was envisaged and was begun in the 1930s would, would be undermined from the end of the Second World War onwards by the rapidly rising prison population. The difficulties of the post-war economy meant that new purpose-built prisons could not be afforded. And therefore, a number of prisons were created using what was readily available, i.e. former military sites. And there's still a number of prisons that occupy former military sites. This is one of the, the largest ones. This is the open prison at HMP Ford. Um, and at the end of the 20th century, there were still 27 prisons uh, out of the just over about 130 there were in those days, um, were actually former military sites. Um, and most of these were hutted camps. And this is Ford, where this was the sort of after the after the war, but they built a, a petty officer's accommodation um, just before the, the site became a prison. And it does feel like a university campus when you're there. One of the sites that was taken over to, to create a prison was, as I mentioned before, um, HMP style to be used as a female prison. Um, this had originated as a children's home. Uh, it had been established in 1894 as a cottage colony for children and babies to move them out of the main workhouse at style. The colony opened in 1898 and closed on the 20th of July 1956 and opened for female inmates on the 24th of October 1962. And it gives you some impression of what that female prison might have been like if it had ever been built at Stanwell. During the Second World War, country houses up and down the country were taken over by military authorities. And a number of these at the end of the war did not return to their original owners, but were instead acquired by the prison commission. And this is probably the most spectacular of these. This is Hewell Grange, which along with Gaines Hall and East Sutton Park opened as Borstals in 1946. And in the same year, Ascom Grange near York opened as an adult female prison. Hugh Grange 
um, was at the time we did our survey in the late 1990s, the grandest uh, country house that was still in use by the prison service. It was built between 1884 and 1880, 1891 for um, Robert George Windsor Clive, Lord Windsor, to the designs of Thomas Garner and G.F. Bodley. It remained in the hands of the Windsor family until 1946, but with the cessation of war, um, they didn't want, they didn't take the, the house back. Um, and instead it passed from the Royal Army Ordnance Corps, Corps who'd occupied it during the Second World War and went to the Prison Commission. And it, beautiful house, in late 19th century, wonderful manicured grounds. And it's quite a contrast inside because you've got these grand sort of, uh, sort of palatial spaces, but look at the plastic chairs and, and, and formica covered table there. It doesn't quite go with the grand architecture, which is obvious on the ground floor. Um, and you can see the fantastic sort of entrance hall on the right hand side there. Um, and yes, you get the impression here, this is coming up the main stair. And so these sort of large sort of public spaces are still uh, sort of very, uh, were very um, impressive. But the actual living accommodation was not far from palatial. This is a typical room that had been turned into a, a dormitory for inmates. And some of them actually had little cubicles created within rooms. Um, it was an open prison, um, and it, but it finally closed in 2019. And a lot of the emphasis in the immediate years after World War II was to create sort of open or fairly low security prisons, um, simply just to fill the gap that, that, that was in the, in the prison estate. But it was clear by the 1940s that they also needed to build new secure prisons. Um, but of course, money was very short after the Second World War. In October 1950, the Treasury approved the pris a prison building programme, which would contain um, proposals for two training prisons, each with 300 inmates, two girls' borstals, each holding 100 inmates, two boys' borstals for 150 prisoners each, and a psychiatric hospital slash prison that would house up to 300 inmates. A tentative layout was published in, 19, in the 1950 report of the Prison Commission for a secure training prison holding 300 men. And this sort of tentative layout became HMP Everthorpe um, in the East Riding of Yorkshire. Um, and you're going to see in this building some modern features, some modern architectural features. Uh, the building is obviously not a Victorian building. You can see the, the window forms, the glass bricks, the, 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 the detailing is obviously sort of, you know, of the 1950s, 1960s. You'll see some of these motifs coming up. And you'll see a um, slightly different arrangement. You've got to wish away the plumbing that you can see. But um, there was originally... Um, no toilets in the cells, but there were sort of, if you see the two sort of sticking out bits, they were facilities for the, for the inmates, um, uh, you know, running along the wings. But if you look at the interior, it looks horribly familiar. This is essentially just a 1950s take on a Victorian prison in terms of its wing form. The foundation stone for the prison uh, was laid on the 21st of April. 1956 and the prison opened finally in June 1958. It had been designed by the architects from the Ministry of Works and the Prison Commission. And the key features, as I mentioned, were the use of cells without in-cell sanitation on these sort of wings with open landings, but then sort of the slopping out facilities and, and toilets and showers in those sort of projection, projecting buildings. And but one important thing that it did have was the idea of a central amenities complex that the wings were linked to. And I'll come back to that when I show you some examples a little bit later. The 1959 white paper entitled Penal Practice in a Changing Society was scathing about Everthorpe. It said that the present buildings stand as a monumental denial of the principles to which we are committed. A.W. Peterson, who was chair of the chairman of the Prison Commission in 1961, wrote that 
as cells in the new prisons will be only used as sleeping accommodation, it is no longer necessary that they should be arranged in long wings, sometimes four or five stories high, which can be observed from the centre of the prison. This arrangement, which is the standard plan of the Victorian prison, creates a very gloomy impression and makes it difficult to provide efficient heating, lighting and ventilation. Noises and smells penetrate to every quarter of the prison. So there was discontent within the prison uh, ma management of the prison commission, but also within the architectural profession. And so to address this, a development group for the design of prisons was established, and they began to work on ideas to improve prisons, prison designs, but also to reduce their costs. By June 1959, they had come up with a new type of prison in which there were four T-shaped wings around a central service block. The wings were to be uh, four-storied and each spur to be sort of three or four or five bays long. Um, the ground floors were used for association, dining and offices, while the three upper floors would be used for um, prisoner accommodation. There would be no toilets in the cells, but there would be this central block where you've got the stair, which you can see in the middle here. This is HMP Blunderston. On either side of the stair, toilets and shower facilities, and then the cells are in the, the short wings at either side. We're looking at the, the top of the T, if you like. You'll see the, the rest of it in a minute. The scheme was worked on and worked on, and finally, in February 1961, they began to construct the first of these at HMP Blunderston in Suffolk. Um, and it opened in July 1963 and was the first of the so-called six so-called new wave prisons that were to be the dominant sort of architectural type of the 1960s. Well, actually slightly more than six, but these are the six main standard ones. And I'll show you a, a, a variation uh, of that, a couple of variations a little bit later. So you can see here the plan and the cell blocks again. So if you look at the plan, you have the T-shaped cell blocks at the four corners of a, a, a rectangle. Um, and the rectangle is the a sort, of, sort of common service block, which you can see in the middle of the photograph. And then it's linked by as a link um, to a large workshop, which you can see on the left-hand side, the large rectangle. So if you look at the photograph, the layout is the cell blocks on the left on the right, and there would be two others on the far side of the, the central um, service block, which you can see in the middle there. On the ground floor were education facilities. Then on the uh, first floor, there were dining rooms. There was one dining room for each of the four wings at the four corners of the uh, common service block with a kitchen centrally in between. And then the top floor, which is within the pitch of the roof, was originally two chapels, an Anglican chapel and a Roman Catholic chapel. In the end, they went to just using uh, one chapel and the other became a, a room for other uses. Um, so as to say, six were based on that very same sort of format, you know, with the four T-shaped wings around the common service block. Um, Normally, the wings were four-storied with cells on three of the stories above a ground floor. But at Wellingborough and Long Larton, there were only three stories. Um, and there were sort of slight variations to, in the length of the spurs and the heights, but they were all essentially followed the same plan. This is Calding. I put this on because it was, it was a prison that took a, a, has taken a different approach. It's, it, believe it or not, it's one of the two prisons that I know of that you apply to go to. Um, when you're within the system, um, you can apply to go to HMP Coldingley, which is a prison very much based on industrial work. And so you apply for a job. And if you get the job, you transfer to the prison. The other one is the prison that is that was styled as being the psychiatric prison, but it, it's the it's a prison we now know as HMP Grendon um, in Buckinghamshire. And you apply there and it's to do with sort of therapeutic treatments and, and group therapy and things like that um, and it's slightly it's similar to this design but it goes off on a slightly different tangent to be to make it feel slightly more hospital-like 
Um, and that's calling again, that's the central service block, um, I think in the mid, probably that's where the paint has been being used recently, uh, when we took this photograph back in the 1990s. Um, and the difference between Caldingley and um, the other, sort of the standard uh, new wave prisons is the size of the, the work spaces. You see there are two vast workshops there. As I say, it's a prison that you had to apply to go to. Um, oh, that's one of the, um, I like this shot because it reminds me of um, the 1960s, 70s Coronation Street with um, Hilda Ogden's mural on the wall. But this is one of the uh, detail of one of the four dining rooms in the common service block. And that's the uh, the large workshop where they were making road signs at the time we visited. There were variations on this new wave theme. Um, this is one that's fairly close in plan, but on this occasion they've taken five wings and put them in a linear form along a, a central block, um, wide block corridor with offices and things on it and then attached to that are sort of um, education facilities and um, the chapel but you've also got a couple of a few sort of workshop facilities at the top of the plan and if you look at the uh, aerial photograph you can see it just soon after it had opened you can see the central sort of wide corridor structure the wings at the top leading off and then workshop facilities, education facilities um, attached to it. And then you can see the chapel, quite sort of nice 1960s chapel there. There were a couple of um, designs that riffed on the theme of the courtyard rather than sort of having T-shaped wings. Um, and they were um, at um, HMP Franklin and HMP Full Sutton. But for complicated reasons, the sites were acquired in the 1960s and were designed in the ninth, and the prisons were designed in the 1960s. And they don't end up actually getting built and, and being operated until the 1980s. So although they followed very much the same sort of plan as originally laid out in the 1960s, they're actually built in a much later style. And they're actually sort of uh, wings based around courtyards, but it's the same floored type of, of wing. These are not wings with sort of open landings. These are hotel style accommodation with a corridor with cells opening off both sides of the corridor. And that's the interior of one of the courtyards. This is uh, both coincidentally Franklin and Full Sutton were high security prisons, uh, part of the dispersal program. Um, um, but I think that was coincidental. But um, you can see, although it was 1960s design, it's very much built in a 1980s style. Then come into the 1970s and there's a, a slight beginning to already modify the, the new wave design. Um, so they're still building um, cell blocks with um, sort of hotel style cell blocks uh, with, an, you know, with corridors with cells off on either side, no open landings. Again, they're having uh, facilities on the ground floor and then cells on the upper floors. But there's been a change and the change is evident in the fenestration, as you can see here at Blunderston. If you look at the, the very left hand side of the slide, you can see in half shadow one of the 1960s wings. And each cell in the 1960s wing does not have an in-cell toilet. So you get a, let out to go and use uh, the communal facilities or more realistically, you end up slopping out. Um, by the 1970s, they wanted to actually go back to having um, toilets and cells. Toilets and cells date back to the 1830s, 1840s with the design of Pentonville Prison but they'd never worked very well um, and so had been progressively removed from Victorian prison designs in the course of the, the 19th century and certainly were no longer a feature by the 1870s um, in new building designs. But here you can see from the rhythm of the windows you've got cells with um, en suites if you like, that's making it sound rather grand, but they're, they're, they're small toilets units beside the cell, cells that now typically would have two inmates. And the same sort of thing happens at Bristol, where we're getting sort of another 1970s wing. Again, the rhythm of the windows tells you it's about um, having in-cell, uh, 
en suites, if you like, rather than sort of uh, toilets, um, communal sort of toilets, you know, in a, in a sort of a sanitary annex, they would call it, I suppose, in the official term. And if you look in the far distance, you can actually see a 1960s wing there at Bristol, where they don't have in-cell toilet, um, en suite toilet facilities. And that's just one to just show you what the atmosphere, what the feeling is like inside one of these sort of um, new wave or 1970s prisons. Quite lacking in light um, and feel quite sort of confined. And um, just from talking to people, uh, both staff and inmates when we visited, they all much prefer to be in a Victorian prison than they did to be in one of these um, sort of more up-to-date um, cell blocks. There was a growing unease about the state of the prison um, state in the by the 1980s, and the Control Review Committee um, recommended that new generation developments that were been taking place in the United States should be examined as the basis of the design of a future high security prison. So but even before that, new generation ideas were beginning to be employed for young offenders institutions, which were the successors to Borstals. The term new generation has become linked in England with predominantly triangular house blocks. So they're no longer calling them cell blocks, they're called house blocks. But the new generation is, is, is as much about an approach to managing a prison and inmates as it is to the physical form of the building. Inmates are held in small or smallish groups where they're able to interact closely with staff, allowing continuous direct supervision. This is designed to create a safe atmosphere and inmates can be encouraged to become more compliant through a structured system of rewards and punishments. The architecture is focuses primarily on small units designed to contribute to the safe atmosphere with as few dehumanizing features as, as is consistent with security. In the USA, the house block with two stories of cells around a central association area became the standard form for carrying out this new approach to imprisonment. This form allowed the whole unit to be continuously supervised without the staff having to consciously patrol, i.e. they could stand in one place uh, or sit at a desk, central control desk, and see everything that's going on in the public spaces um, within the wing. The need for a detailed research report was recognised and a working group comprising officials from the Home Office and the Property Services Agency um, undertook visits to America in 84 and 85 to examine a number of new generation prisons and conventional designs. And their, their findings were published in a document called New Directions in Prison Design in 1985. It provided a favourable assessment of new generation designs and summarised the basic management and architectural ideas that would underpin the approach to new uh, prison design. The creation of a, small, a, a number of small units on a large site could provide a range of differentiated regimes that would accommodate invade inmates who provided a variety of security con or control problems. And at Feltham, they were able to um, obviously have some of the tougher, more dangerous sort of young offenders in some of the units. And they had some of the youngest children kept separate from them in, in other units. Um, this is one of the triangular house blocks. They're triangular in plan as well as in profile. Um, and although there is the presence of bars, they're designed to look a little bit more uh, human, uh, a little bit more approachable than a sort of monumental prison building. And that's the interior there. Um, I think I'll just explain a little about the photography that we did. I had this great photographer called James Davis working with me. And to get true colour wherever possible, we asked um, the people in wings to switch all the lights off, which proved rather difficult in modern prisons because they're never designed to be switched off. So you're getting a true architectural picture, but you're not getting the feel of when all the sort of neon lights are on, all the fluorescent lights are on, because of course they they change the colour of a photograph. Um, so I just thought to say that because it, it feels slightly shady and gloomy, but in fact, with the lights on, it's actually quite a bright space. And that gives you the impression you've got cells on 
so it's a triangular plan. One side of the triangle is all window, letting lots of light in, and the other two sides are cells on two stories. Um, because it's only two stories, you don't need to worry about too much about people falling or being thrown off. There's a seating area there you can see for the television. There's a pool table. I think they're playing um, baby football there behind the stairs, the inmate and the officer. So it's quite a small scale, quite an intimate sort of space. And the plan on the right shows you the sort of the zones, if you like, that you could operate. And each of the sort of almost look a bit like Isle of Man type sort of triskelion, you know, arrangement. But these are all triangular house blocks linked by a business street, it's called, which is just a secure corridor uh, to take inmates around all the site. And then it links it to links all the house blocks to sort of communal facilities as well. Um, these um, new generation young offenders institutions were, were already beginning to operate in the early 80s, but the report was to see whether they could apply this new generation thinking to um, adult secure prisons. Um, and they came back with this favourable report. And so they embarked on the construction of three adult prisons, um, one at uh, Milton Keynes, one at Doncaster, and the third site at Lancaster Farms. Um, this is the first, this is the third of these, Lancaster Farms. It was designed um, and built as a Category C training prison for adult males. But when it actually opened in 1993, it was used as a young offenders institution and remand centre. Um, so this is one of the house blocks. Um, there were originally um, three blocks around sort of a central green area, but this is one of these three pairs of house blocks. So if you look left and right of this sort of menacing spaceship looking thing are the house blocks, two storied with cells in them with, as you can see, a very large window there. In the centre are offices and dining facilities shared between the pair of house blocks. And that gives you the impression, again, we've had the lights switched off, but normally 24 hours a day, seven days a week, there are sort of fluorescent neon lights on. But you can see it's designed to be a, um, you know, a single space. You can actually, from you know, anywhere, you can see everything going on. So it's, it, it was designed to be easier to control. Um, and so you don't have to have sort of constant patrolling up and down landings. Um, and the, the sort of architectural design was also extended to other sort of parts. And this is one of the, the, the visitors, uh, visit sites, you know, where um, the family and friends of inmates could actually come and visit them. Um, the second of the three was at Doncaster. Um, and here they took a slightly different approach. Um, instead of uh, two story house blocks, they've and flanking um, sort of a central services thing, they've actually put the two house blocks one on top of the other. So what you're looking at here on the right hand side in the four storey building is actually run as two separate house blocks, a lower one and an upper one, then attached to some sort of facilities. And then on the left hand side, um, the sort of two storey snaking sort of corridor arrangement picks up that theme of the business street we saw at Felton. And it picks up on sort of ideas that have been explored in the new wave prisons in the 1960s. Um, but in this sort of new generation prison, they have sort of a ground floor open um, walkway, um, which is underneath, if you like, um, and can be used by supervised inmates or staff. And it's for moving food trolleys and things like that around. And then above is a secure corridor. So inmates can literally be put into the corridor at one end and, and just make their way largely unaccompanied and come out at the other end, uh, wherever they're meant to be being taken to. Um, the impact of having a house block on top of the other is that the ground floor one is actually very lacking in light. Um, and again, we've, ha we've had the lights switched off, so it, it does present a slightly artificial thing. It would be brighter with lights on. Um, and there you can see the upper one, which does benefit from having sort of top lighting. Um, again, they're still trying to bring in light by large windows. You can see a couple of them there on the left and in the centre of the picture. 
And again, this is a picture showing the, sort of the, the interior of the, the prison, if you like, with the gardens in the middle, and then this approach to two stories of, of walkway, and, and one that would be supervised or for staff use, and the upper one used by inmates, uh, needing fewer staff to supervise their behaviour. The third and the most spectacular of the new generation prisons uh, was built at Milton Keynes at Wood Hill. Um, and they took a slightly different approach. They decided to go for, uh, again, triangular house blocks, but instead of two stories, they took them up to three stories and that allowed them to have the same amount of accommodation, but to um, have a giant window occupying the third face of the, of the triangle. And you get this amazing sort of light flooding in. Um, Again, so you've got a very large space, but it's very easily, everything can be seen. There's not a lot of blind spots that you would get in other kinds of prisons, particularly ones with those sort of long corridors snaking through them. And then that's the outside, it's looking rather sort of futuristic, like a stealth bomber. But this is one of the design features that was introduced in some uh, new generation prisons to have this sort of sawtooth configuration to um, stop inmates passing things, um, you know, from cell window to cell window, um, contraband and other things that you could do with, uh, with swinging a rope. Um, Needless to say, something that's architecturally impressive as that cost an absolute fortune. Um, and on seeing how much it had cost and seeing how architecturally grand it was, the, the prison service set its face against sort of going further down that path. But even before um, Wood Hill had opened in 1993, there was other sort of thinking going on about prison design. In the 1985-6 annual report of the prison department, um, they also uh, featured this prison that had just been created at Stanford Hill in Kent. Um, and it is um, a return, frankly, to Victorian forms. On the outside, it looks, you know, it looks like a, a cell block. You can see a wing in the foreground, then central services or offices, etc. another wing beyond. But internally, that's the form. So what we're seeing is a revival of the architecture, architectural form that had been adopted by the Victorians, then despised in the 1950s, and then miraculously makes us return um, in the 1980s. In the 1986-7 report, um, there was discussion about the direction that we should take for future cell blocks designs. Um, in the report, uh, just what quote very briefly, it says a design used by the Directorate of Works at Stanford Hill, the prison I've just shown you, has been developed for use at prisons at Woolwich, Bicester and Whitemoor. The design with cells leading from galleries on either side of a rectangular wing allows better supervision than corridor based living blocks. So on seeing the design of Stanford Hill, they're immediately saying we need to incorporate that kind of internal spatial arrangement and move away from the hotel style, the corridor based living blocks that we had uh, had seen dominating in the 1960s and 70s. The three prisons would be designed on very much the same plan, and this is a plan of Bullingdon. Um, not the famous Bullingdon Club, but this is HMP Bullingdon. And if you look at the plan, it looks surprisingly similar to the new wave prisons of the 1960s. You've got T or X shaped blocks. They're linked by sort of open, uh, open by uh, linked by sort of closed corridors, well, closed and open corridors, you know, um, like we we saw um, in the new generation prisons. But so we've got a mixture of the plans. We've got the new wave plan, and we've got some of the new generation thinking, um, but the internal space of these buildings is, is harks back now to the Victorian style. So the wings are short like the, um, the ones of the new wave prisons, but they're now open from ground to roof. And so you have to have the suicide prevention netting put in, but um, they're, um, so they're harking back to sort of Victorian space but using sort of new wave, new generation prison designs. 
And this then became the standard form for new prisons being built in the 1990s. Um, and a big sort of daddy version of it, of that plan was actually built at Bulling, at uh, Belmarsh. And you can see here one of the wings at Belmarsh and then the sort of two-story corridor on the left. Um, the problem, as I mentioned before, was that these prisons were causing, costing a small fortune. Um, Belmarsh cost £160 million to build, a cost of £189,000 a cell. And Lancaster Farms and Woodhill were even more expensive per cell. So there was a move now to start to try and build sort of larger, um, cheaper, sort of, although you wouldn't guess it from this building, um, new sort of prison blocks at existing cells, uh, prison blocks at existing prisons. And this is one of the first, this is at Leeds in the 1990s, where they built a new sort of a pair of wings with a centre, a bit like the Victorian centre of Pentonville, where you, somebody, could somebody mute the, um, I'm getting a lot of feedback, sorry. So you've got a Victorian centre um, there, um, and you can see this, the suicide netting. This is on the ground floor, and there are offices, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then we go up to the upper floor, and so this is the centre between the wings. So it's a new sort of prison complex within the existing historic prison at Leeds. And then there's the wing. So we're back very much to the, the form of Victorian prison wing. But the problem with this was, even though it was thought to be a basically cheaper, quicker way of getting uh, places, the rising prison population was outstripping the speed with which new prisons were being built, leading to severe overcrowding. And of course, culminates in the great riots at Strangeways in 1990 and other disturbances. So the prison service uh, decided to come up with standardized uh, prison wing designs um, and they're called DOWs, Director of Works and then a number wings. So this is the DOW1 um, and it's known colloquially as the Bedford unit. And eight of these have been built by 1991. And it's a rectangular block with cells around the outside and then open from you know, floor to ceiling. And then that sort of ominous looking control tower is effectively the control tower it's uh, officers um, offices and they can monitor what's going on from there um, Norwich has one of the DOW4 or the IV the Roman numerals um, DOW4 and um, galleried wings but built to a standard design and um, more than 20 of these standardized wings had been added to uh, existing prisons in the, the last decade of the 20th century. And again, it's still quite um, sort of architecturally impressive, but standardized, you know, we've got now standard form of railing and standard form of everything. Despite all this activity, prison numbers were still growing quicker than, than buildings could be built. So um, the emergency accommodation program was um, initiated. Um, it's all part of Michael Howard's prison, prison works sort of mantra. And so the emergency accommodation program began in 1996. And within two years, it pr was providing over 4000 new spaces. Um, a small number were created using some of these standard um, DOW designs, but they also brought in a new one. And this is one of the new ones. This is the DOW six. Um, this is at Everthorpe. And it looks like a fairly standard prison wing that you've seen, cells, central sort of office, dining accommodation, et cetera, et cetera, another wing there. The difference is that um, that cell block went up in a few months. Um, it's a concrete raft uh, with all the services created on it. And then um, some brick sort of end walls, et cetera. But essentially all the cells come in on the back of lorry and we were actually at one prison we saw cells being lifted off lorries put into place and bolted into position so most of the effort was in the laying of the concrete raft and the cell block took no time at all to build and that's the interior of it um, some of these are built in concrete but some are actually in metal the metal ones are slightly unfortunately sort of sounds a bit tinny a bit like being stuck in a bell but um, they could be built very quickly and were better than the overcrowded conditions that inmates faced in historic prisons at the time. They also brought in um, 
some these called ready to use units and these were actually a, just a standard design that had been developed for um, oil workers and gas workers in Scandinavia I think particularly Norway and great amusement at the time was um, was found in the fact that they came with a ready fitted sauna well in fact they didn't come with a sauna the plans had sauna on it but it was just now left as a room so inmates were not enjoying time and a sauna but extraordinary measures were also taken this is um a ship that was pressed into use um as a cell block um it was one of two that had been built by Bibby Freighters of Liverpool um, to accommodate troops um, in the Falkland Islands after the United Kingdom had recaptured the islands. Um, and uh, long story short, one of them was brought from the Falklands to New York, where it was used um, as, a, as a prison there. And this one was also used as a prison with obviously added security measures added, um, and it received its first inmates in July 1997. And it could accommodate 400 inmates in, in the five-story block. And you can see on top those exercise yards, and they were on they were onshore facilities as well. It had a very short life as a prison. And that just gives you some idea of the, the cabins, you know, sort of a cell there, I call it a cabin, but a cell, um, two beds, and then the central corridor running through it. But just to end, just one of the themes at the end of the 20th century that when we were doing our survey between 1995 to 2000 was the move away from the prison service as it had become by then, no longer the prison department. Uh, to no longer have the prison service being responsible for the construction and management of all prisons and the involvement of the private sector. This is Loudham Grange, and this was the site of one of the, the of the first um, boys open borstal that I mentioned uh, with the march up from Felton, and it had all gone by the 1990s and replaced by this purpose built private sector prison. All the wings are two two storied with central sort of control facilities, um, holds about 500 inmates, and you can see they're very much using the standard design that had been um, arrived at by the late 90s um, of some measure of prefabrication but a lot of standardization um, in, in a wing that uh, looks very much like every other wing now. And there's another one at Alt Course um, and you can see clearly that um, they're based on uh, what some of the standard designs the prison service had developed. But a lot of work went on in the late 90s about um, a programme I actually saw firsthand being experimented on, on the safe cell. And um, so some of the findings uh, of that were incorporated into these new prisons. It was a way of making cells safe so that people couldn't self-harm on them. So just to end with current thinking, in, recent years, I mean, the, the private sector is still sort of managing large numbers of prisons, although some have been taken out of private sector control and put back to the prison service. Um, the architecture of new prisons is, is far from exciting. I've not been to many of the, the newest ones, but uh, the ones I've seen are uh, just following on the standard designs. But a big development in recent years has been prison closures. They've talked for many years about closing historic prisons um, and then actually what do they do with them and so there's a lot of discussion about how to use some of the closed sites and, and in recent years we've seen prisons at Shepton Mallet, Kingston and Portsmouth, um, Gloucester um, closing. Um, Blunderston, the, the model prison of the 1960s was actually closed and had been demolished. Um, Dartmoor was due to close but with rising, well, rising but still high prison numbers they've actually now taken another lease on it so it will no longer be closing um, but I was involved in a detailed new study of it in 2013 because the Duchy of Cornwall wants ideas on what to do with this enormous site in the middle of Dartmoor when the day comes that it takes back uh, control of it and that's the, the door of the main gate into Dartmoor main historic gate but congratulations your sentence is over Thank you, Alan. That was uh, fascinating. And um, 
really interesting to see how uh, regularly this, those ideas from Victorian prison design raise their head again and are, are reincorporated. Um, and also I, I was sort of <laughs> struck really by how similar the, the designs of the blocks in the late in the 60s really are to things that are happening with uh, uh, garrison single um, living accommodation and a, a sort of a utopian and red brick universities as, as hall, halls of residence. Um, we're going to uh, open it up to questions. I, I wouldn't mind if I could just ask briefly about um, about Everthorpe and the first of the big of the post-war um, prisons and, and why, given that so much had happened between uh, nationalisation and that point and how critical the prison commission were of it so soon after it opened, why it was such a retrogressive design. Was it simply post-war expediency or uh, and leaning back on what they knew or, or was there something else going on? Well, I, I, I don't, I don't, I can't be absolutely certain, but I suspect it's, it's a problem that, um, you know, what is a prison meant to be like? That's the fundamental question. They think the only model they've got is the Victorian prison. So they just basically fall onto that model. Then they decide, well, it'd be a good idea to have a jolly good think about this. So they seem to build it, then have a think instead of doing it the other way around. But what's interesting is that the, um, what I didn't talk about today was the, um, so you don't go from Everthorpe to Blunderston and what is deemed to be new wave perfection in one go. There were two or three sort of intermediate steps where they half holding on to some of the thinking of Everthorpe uh, while trying to grasp the impact that, that, you know, of having the Blunderson design. And one of them was that one I mentioned, Grendon, which is a sort of strange beast that looks a bit like, it should be like Everthought, but it's actually floored. So it's got the corridors rather than the open landings. So it's a sort of strange sort of hybrid thing. Um, and there's another one at Hindley as well in um, near Wigan. Um, so they were just, the fifties, they were just trying to grapple with, you know, what, what was the prison? It's like those poor people who had to, come up with what is a railway station suddenly in the 1930 in the 1830s um you know it's just a new thing and and rather than wrestle with new ideas they thought we'll just that, that's worked to some extent you know and, and we'll just use that as the the standard model and bolt you know glass bricks onto it and other 50s features right um okay if you have a question that you're happy to ask on camera do use the the raise your hand function um and I'll, I'll start by going to Justin, who has, has done just that. If you don't really want to be on um, camera, uh, do as, as James Bailey has put, put a question in the chat and I'll, I'll put them to Alan uh, as we go. So Justin, over to you. Well, Matt, you've actually kind of uh, anticipated my question to a certain extent, um, which, yeah, the, the parallels with university campuses uh, and especially halls of residence and the kind of back and forth flow in style through the through the post-war period seems very, very familiar. So to what extent do you think the changes that you've described are changing ideas about confinement and control versus broader changing architectural ideas about ways to house a large number of people? Um, I, I think it's a. I think it's probably a mixture of both because they are at different times quite consciously thinking about how do because this constant tension between confinement and rehabilitation, and so you know, and and of course, although there might be general agreement across the whole um, prison service at any one time about what their goals are, different governors do it in slightly different ways, and I, I've met some incredibly inspiring governors who are who were determined to put as much emphasis into rehabilitation and education as they could within the budget that they had um, so it's partly sort of changing thinking about regime but as you say it's also following to some extent um, you know changing views on architecture so you know the 1950s was a time when we were repudiating everything Victorian um, and saying, oh, no, turn our back on that. You know, I can tell you stories of doing that seaside resorts as well. Um, so in, in that sense, it's following that trend and then coming up with glossy new, what was thought to be modern hotel style uh, buildings in the 60s and 70s. But um, one of the things we did when we've, and I visited 140 of every open prison, every prison that was open 
uh, at the end of the 20th century. And inmates and staff universally all preferred to be in the Victorian type space, whether it was a Victorian one or a new gallery or new generation even one, than they did in the corridor style ones. They didn't like it. They found it very oppressive. Um, you know, a bit like walking down the endless corridors of a Premier Inn. You know, it's that. I, shouldn't, I, I, I do like staying at Premier Inns, but I don't like the corridors much. And just before I go to James, just as well, a follow up from that. Is that because in those sort of hotel style, they don't invest as much um, of their sort of uh, architectural currency in those big clear streets and atria and skylights that, that flood through the vertically open wings in the way that the, the, the travel in the Premier Inn style just don't? Well, if you think about it, there's, there's, with those corridor style ones, there isn't public space. If you're talking about by public, I mean inmate inmate and staff public space the great thing about new generation and the new uh, and the new gallery prisons and victorian ones is you've got that central space which you can see a lot of the activity and people come out into that space um rather than being sort of trapped in their cells so it's, it feels more open i mean there are sitting rooms and things in those hotel style ones but they are just ordinary rooms with a television in and maybe a pool table um so they don't quite have the and quite have the character, you know, that, that some of these more architecturally impressive uh, prisons have. So, you know, it's, it's architecture delivering, you know, to good effect, I would say, uh, in creating a sort of a, a more positive environment for, for inmates and for staff. It leads nicely on to James's question, actually. Um, and he'd like to know whether you formed a view as to which layout of prison works best. And if you could also go on to say a bit more about Blunderstone and why that one didn't work and has, has subsequently gone. Well, I, I mean, the prison with the, the prison with the highest success, if you, if you measure uh, prison success by how many, the rate of reoffending, and I'm not up to date on these figures, um, so I won't, I won't give you actual figures, but um, the most successful prison for non-recidivism was HMP Grendon. That's the prison um, that was built as a psychiatric slash group therapy based um, prison. The, and it's successful because inmates have to want to go there and they have to commit to the program. And therefore, it's very successful. It's possibly one of the worst buildings in the entire. It's terrible. It's that horrible hybrid Victorian long wing with corridors, but corridors like the hotel, it's architecturally dreadful, but it's you know it's such a strong regime that it's highly effective um the atmosphere in the new generation prisons is the best atmosphere um but whether atmosphere translate into success I, well, i'd be hesitant to to speculate and uh, a comment and a question on on the on the chat um pointing to the victorian model allowing a relatively small number of officers to um, to control the, the wings due to the sort of um, large, you know, lack of hidden spaces and good visibility up and down them. Um, well, but also because the inmates didn't come out of their cells. So if you imagine Pentonville, it's, um, it's got a centre, a bit like the one I showed you at Leeds. You know, it looked like a very nice shopping centre, but with bars. Um, so it had the centre and you could literally stand in that centre You and uh, the original design, you could look down all four wings. Everything had to be done in silence. So if anybody was up to anything, you could really hear it. So you could put people in the wings. Um, you know, a, a handful of staff could actually oversee what was going on for 500 inmates because the inmates are in their cells. Now, we couldn't do that. That's too dehumanising, although you do hear terrible stories about how long inmates have been spending in cells, particularly in the last couple of years. Um, so we're obviously going to need more staff than that. But um, new generation prisons are actually built to maximise contact between staff and inmates, but also to make it as easy a space to kind of oversee. Um, and generally, I say the atmosphere feels quite good and feels quite positive. And it, What's funny is you go into one of those wings and they always feel busy. There's a lot, believe it or not, from the photographs, we had to get everybody out of the wings to take the photographs. Um, so some of them got locked back up in their cells, but they always feel like quite busy, quite sociable spaces. Um, as I say, there's a lot of sort of positive attitudes between inmates and, and staff, and they seem to 
I say generally agree with the the positive atmosphere in, in that kind of prison. And that's presumably why in the in those um, some of those sixty prisons they started to delete toilets in the cells because the assumption would be that the prisoners would not be in their cells for such long periods of time. Well, yeah, the, the, the cells are a lot smaller because they were going to be for one person at a time and they would be, the original plan was to they'd be buzzed out like in America and they could go to the toilet. In fact, that didn't happen. Um, but they, they ended up with a horrible slopping out. So, you know, anyway, so it, that aspect didn't really work. But um, no, they, they wanted in the 60s, they wanted inmates to be out of the cells as much as possible, apart from at night for sleeping. The, the question that was associated with the comment on the chat was about who else was involved in the design process um, beyond simply architects. Were, were there you know, psychologists and, and criminologists yeah. feeding in to try and improve the prison, improve yeah. prison life through architecture? Yeah, the, some of these groups, I mean, I can't tell you about the precise constitution of any of them, but they came from a whole range of people. There were people who were experts in, in, in all aspects of sort of uh, penology, um, as you say, um, psychiatric staff would have been consulted but it's a lot of they, they were quite good at getting or oh, right I shouldn't have thought of this story but I'll tell it in a minute but getting people with actual on the ground experience involved in it so these people might now be quite senior management but they'd come up through the ranks and had been prison officers on wings and so they knew of, of what they spoke um I know that a lot of history, they talk about um, the importance of oral history. And um, for my work on new generation prisons, I actually went down to Devon to interview one of the people who'd been involved. And I knew had been at meetings. Um, he was a sort of deputy governor of a prison by this stage in the 19, early 80s. Um, and he denies he'd been at the meeting. I went, because thinking I was going to get this fund of sort of first-hand knowledge for these meetings he'd been to, he said, no, I, I never went to that. But he's down in the official records of having been at the meetings. So um, that was one of the um, less successful bits of research that I undertook. Do you have any further questions? I don't see any hands up. Or I've, got, I've got one question. Yes, good, do. Does Fiona Barclay own that Picasso? That would be my vital question. It's a very nice painting. Sorry, that was flippant. Sorry. A chance to respond. Could I make a couple of observations? You may. Um, one is that you know what you what you say, Alan, about the Victorian wings sort of working. Um, I've I've been into Chelmsford Prison a few times for one reason or another, and. You, if you know it, you'll know that they have various different styles of building on the on the there. And um, I, I said to the governor one day, "Well, you know, wouldn't you like to? Wouldn't you? Wouldn't you love it to have a completely new prison with all new buildings?" And and she actually said, "No, she finds that she works best with the Victorian wings, and and that's what that's what's still good." And it's so interesting to see. Um, how that basic format has sort of kept kept coming back. And the other thing that just occurred to me was that looking at your photographs of some of the more recent prisons, where, where you've got the, the, the suicide nets, uh, and the idea of a suicide net is that you have an old prison and you have a problem with people throwing themselves off the galleries, so you put in a net. The idea of building a building, a building with the net in it from day one suggests you've got a very fundamental flaw that's not being not being addressed well the problem is that um the when the victorian prisons were built originally they didn't have any suicide netting that comes in at the end of the 19th century when inmates were now going to be on the wings much more and not you know directly supervised by inmates and they're called suicide netting but in fact it's more often for people being pushed over but what you may not have noticed in um the designs is that Yes, they've got the suicide netting. That's a consequence of, have, of wanting to have the Victorian form. But the handrails are now at armpit height. So in the Victorian prison, it was very easy to push an inmate over because they, 
the handrails were at sort of waist height. The minute you put the handrail to just under the armpit height, it's really hard to get anybody over. So they've actually tried to sort of factor that into the design to reduce the number of incidences of people going over the over the rail. Um, and in some historic prisons, they actually kept the historic railings and welded on raised bits so they could keep some of the historic character. Um, but and others, they just simply replaced the the, the old historic um, rail railings with with the, the higher ones. So they were conscious of that. They accepted that there was an issue with the suicide, people falling or being thrown or jumping, um, but they mitigated it by the raising of the handrails. A couple of more questions come in. One in the uh, from Eleanor in the chat, and then I'll come to you, uh, Tim. Um, so two part question as to why we, you think so many of the Victorian prisons are still in use and um, thoughts as, as what should happen to these buildings um, if, if they are to close and go out of use permanently. Um, right. Lots of been lots of thinking about this has been going on. Um, I, I got very involved with Dartmoor because for taking just Dartmoor as an example, um, the prison service gave notice. It has to give 10 years notice to the duchy. Uh, this was around about. 2012 2013 I think it was so it's give 10 years notice we did a revised investigation more detail and revised the listing description so the listing would be very precise about what we in historic England as we now are but we're English heritage then what we felt were the key buildings that should be safeguarded if possible and what could be allowed to go to enable the architects working for the duchy to come up with schemes um, to to redevelop the site. Now the problem with Dartmoor is if that if that prison was in the outskirts of a city, um, dead easy, bit of retail here and there, housing, you name it, it'll be umpteen options. The um, the square foot cost for housing at Princetown is so low that they couldn't work out any viable scheme to turn that into housing. So they were looking at hybrid bits of housing, bits of museumification and all that kind of stuff. Um, one of the reasons for shutting Dartmoor is it was expensive and it's difficult to get to. One of the great strengths of Victorian historic prisons are they're very easy to get to. They're in towns and cities. Families can get to them. They're convenient for the courts. They've got all sorts of convenient sort of things. Um, they're almost all on sites that are too cramped and are difficult in that sense uh, to, to, to work. The ones that have closed in recent years, well, some are going to be housing. That's undoubtedly the case. Um, there was talk, and I don't know if it was followed through about um, Canterbury when it closed, because it's beside the university, it was going to be used as halls of residence. I, I've never chased that up to see what happened to that. Um, but they're still exploring sort of housing schemes for, for most of these sort of prison sites, um, because, um, there's only so many prison museums that any one country can stand. Um, and um, although they may contain some museum element or some should appropriately contain some kind of commemorative element, they're going to have to find a use for them. And um, three of them were bought by a housing developer who's now just running them, you know, for people to visit while they're working out how to adapt the sites. Uh, so it's still a bit of a watch this space. And, and I've stood with architects and, and people from historic England and we've stood there and gone, well, what do you do? How do you turn a cell block into a desirable block of flats while keeping its original character? You know, how do you split it horizontally, vertically? And, you know, so I don't think there's a clever, I mean, hotels have been the obvious solution. Um, Oxford has got one where, uh, you know, two or three cells becomes a hotel bedroom. I stayed in one in Helsinki that has two cells for the bedroom, one cell for the, the ensuite bathroom. So hotels are an obvious solution, but um, they've got, got to be in the right place to, to get the clientele. Tim, do you want to um, ask your question? Sorry, I can't. I can't get my screen on. Um, can Can I pick up two points? Um, Hannity talked about suicide netting and location, and I should say that I'm speaking from my, my kind of previous career when I was an insider within the prison service and at one time responsible for 
prison building. Um, after the Wolf Report, um, the strange way disturbances that Alan mentioned earlier, um, and the advent of neoliberalism in the approach to building new prisons with the private finance initiative. Um, and that came together very interestingly in the sense that one of the key Wolf recommendations was if you had a, an opportunity to do something positive in prison, um, the most sensible thing was to try and keep prisoners as close as possible to their home locations, to their families. So that required prisons in urban areas. And believe me, that was extremely difficult to achieve. I did two public inquiries, um, one in Liverpool, um, one in Greater Manchester, arguing for the creation of new prisons in those cities against huge local opposition. And I kind of think that that is one of the big issues around prison design, that um, getting the right amount of land, and as prison designs improved, became more open, moved away from the um, Victorian kind of very centralized approach. Um, the land requirement became so huge, which was not only expensive, it was actually very difficult to find sites. And I think that's why you have state, stacked house blocks in Doncaster. So that's a, a missing element um, in the picture. But um, coming back to um, suicide nets, um, the private finance initiative was almost like trying to run a, an architectural competition. Um, the prison service said it wanted some new approaches to how prisons are designed. And there were the design guidances, guides um, that created minimum specifications, such as the, the type of walls and anti-climbing devices on walls, but house blocks and location central services, et cetera, were quite open and uh, were quite left quite open. And one of the big changes that occurred was suddenly people stopped putting large fortress-like central prisons, uh, central prison kitchens. Uh, again, a le legacy of the, of the uh, Manchester riot experience inside the prison, placing them outside the wall, having smaller prisons inside the secure perimeter. Um, but one of the most fascinating discussions that I presided over was looking at a proposal, and this was part prison in Bridge End, where it was group, it was um, S4. Um, it's more, um, sorry, um, Secure Corps at the time, they were leading on the management part of that consortium. And they were challenged by, by technical experts who were saying, well, where are the anti-suicide nets? And they said, we are not going to put anti-suicide nets in. We are going to manage the suicide risk by the relationship established by, with prisoners. And that was the most radical design that came out of that particular program. Um, and there you've got a kind of tension um, between a team that was very um, representative of architectural ideas taken particularly from the USA, UK prison experience, um, and then kind of having those proposals challenged in terms of how the prison service traditionally worked. So you've got that. And then the final element of this jigsaw puzzle is cost. Um, as people have said, people, and I found this myself, you know, I've been to Lenka, I was at Lancaster Farms once and talking to an officer about that must be much better working here than in a traditional Victorian prison. No, it's not. I feel so isolated from my staff. Visible sight lines are good, but if you need assistance, it would take a long time for them to reach there. And I think kind of almost stakeholder preference for that kind of very tight centralized design plus the economics and the treasury of course were always breathing down the prison services back um came together to go for much more compact design so you come to a kind of new victorian um option um sort of a, a, as a preference as a result of a combination of stakeholder preferences and the fact that it's more economical to to build and run a prison in that way well, just picking up on a few of those points, um, yeah, the 
this move, I mean, it's been accelerating in recent years. They want to get rid of the, the, the small urban prisons, but they are well liked and very convenient yeah. for people. And go to these huge sort of brown fields sort of prisons, like the one up at Wrexham, which I haven't visited, but oh no, it's a huge one. So 2,000 plus, I think, inmates. So that's moved a completely different sort of direction. Uh, you know, and, and, and this want to use brown field sites, which are not necessarily in a convenient place. And I have been to some towns and cities where you see the horrifying costs that people have to pay for a taxi to get from the railway station up to the prison just to see their their family or friend um park i, I park's very interesting because um that was oh, there's nobody here from from park but that was uh one of our more challenging visits um <laughs> so they were using electronics a lot for control um instead of people which was one serious issue. Um, and um, on the day we were there, the inner of the two electronic gates, the front gate was jammed open, um, which was rather amusing. It's the only place I've ever smelt cannabis being smoked in a workshop. Um, it was undermanned, really, as far as I could see. There just didn't seem to be enough staff. And I take your point about um, the new generation design. I mean, there should be a body of staff just beyond the first gate. In theory, that's the plan. But of course, um, with staffing cuts, you know, to save money, uh, staff have just got thinner and thinner on the ground. So I think even in the time I was going uh, from, to prisons in the 1990s through to recent, more recent visits, there seems to be far fewer staff about. Um, and one thing I didn't talk about, which I maybe should have just mentioned, just at least in passing, as a result of the Wolf Report and the riots at, at Strangeways, um, there was a revamp of... Victorian prisons and as I mentioned before they sort of put up the height of handrails to stop people being pushed over but one of the things they did was most perhaps visually destructive to Victorian prisons was they split wings in half so that instead of having one long Victorian wing they put a metal grill essentially right down the middle so the glorious interior of the prison at Preston um, which is a stunning Victorian interior um, that we used as one of our book covers split in half on our second visit just with a big grill down it so you are now dealing with two units of say 50 or 60 inmates instead of one wing of 120 so those were all sort of reactions to to the wolf report but um yeah it's this constant battle about budgets and um one of the things that i got a lot of feedback with was how little money they had to spend on non-basics like education and things like that so it was the budgets have been squeezed and, and quite how prisons manage to balance the budget it does amaze me. I, th I think I'll defend the splitting Victorian wings because then you've got smaller units. You oh, yeah, can keep exactly. different types oh, of yeah. prisoners together. So I think that's unnecessary. Yeah, it's just evil. visually, no, it's just very, no, visually, visually, destruct I agree. visually destructive, but no. it does make, it made good sense for sort of control because one of the, one of the findings, of course, the Wolf Report was because because there wasn't enough of that sort of metal work, once something broke out, there was no way of containing it. It just yes. took the whole prison. Once, yes. So in the future, if something goes off, okay, it might have a ripple effect, but you can contain it within the units. And that's why when you look at somewhere like Pentonville, the amount of metal, you know, between the centre was once open, you could stand there and see down every wing, and it's just a maze now of metal just to, separate each of the wings and then let's say some of the wings actually to split them uh, so it was a necessary evil but um, aesthetically <laughs> ruined our photographs yeah and and, and that's why you know not only do you get the metal work but you suddenly find with lots of fences in the yep. um, secure area suddenly people start putting s wire on top which makes it worse and then debris gets caught yeah but if you go to a french prison believe me a modern french prison it's even worse than that um they have lots of fences they have lots of barbed wire um yeah. conditions outside can be quite squalid yeah. um compared with the kind of standards that i've been in prison this this century but the, the kind of standards being achieved towards the end of the last century, um, I would say that the UK was well ahead of France mm. and probably well ahead of most US jurisdictions where I spent quite a lot of time in prison. But when did you go to Park? Uh, about 98, I suppose it was. 
Like, yeah, like, because yeah. they did take a lot of electronic controls out. Yeah. Um, I think some of it went before 98 yeah. because yeah. the original plan was very American. They yeah. would have a central disk in that large day space in the house block. It's, it's very close yeah. to the yeah. new generation house blocks yeah. you can show you. And um, the, the guy, one one officer would stand um, at that and control and, and control yep. unlocking and locking. Um, we actually looked at that. But, when but, it, but that, but... that didn't work in UK yep. conditions. Also, the unlocking was compromised. The operators were fined a very large sum, and they went back to a more traditional approach yep. of someone opening the door and closing yep. the door and, and sort of checking yep. the prisoner at the same time, which, yep. which struck me as much more humane and also resulted in much more one-to-one um, -one contact yeah. than you would get in a standard American prison where you can get almost a Pentonville system, but everything's electronic now. You've got all these big radiating hubs for cells and one guy sitting in the center just pressing levers yeah. and opening doors. So that's very inhuman. I, I remember going to the control room at Park and I seem to remember we'd arrived and they'd stopped using the cell locking and they were doing they'd gone to do it by hand um and but they were still using all the surveillance sort of aspect of it um but um i don't know if you've ever been to one of the oh, i can't remember what it was called one of the wings at gloucester actually experimented with electronic locking and unlocking i think back in the 70s um and i don't think it proved very successful uh, because they thought they'd go down the american path um save manpower etc I don't I think it was the only one that was tried out at the time. I think it was a, one of the wings in Gloucester. Um, and I think it was mid to late 70s. I can't remember off the top of my head, but it, it yeah, it, we just thought, no, we can't go down that route. And um, I, I didn't see that. But there's an interesting link between surveillance through cameras and actually managing the prison. The, one of the other problems um, with what always seemed before, before I got involved in this and understood how prison officers, uh, governors and, and, and prisoners viewed prison life. Um, when you look at these wide open spaces, the most senior governor can't actually get around the prison every day. Mm. And that's very important. That was clearly a problem at a number of prisons. Yep. And at Old Course, which is for Zachley in Liverpool, one of the PFI prisons, um, they actually did very well. Ramsbottom, who was no walkover um, when he was in chief inspector of prisons, um, did his first inspection there. And he actually said, this is quite marvellous. This is a local prison where I've left feeling for once reasonably positive. Mm. And, the and the first um, governing governor there, but, but director uh, in PFI parlance, actually worked very hard at, at walking um, the prison. But he also, when he went to his office, he got television screens, keeping yeah. an eye on what was happening. Yeah. And, and that's another issue when you get to um, a modern, a, a kind of uh, second half 20th century design compared to the Victorian design. It's actually very difficult for one person to manage a prison. Then theoretically, you could split it into, to, into more um, autonomous units. But, but but quite often the makeup of the prisons doesn't necessarily allow for that kind of thing. So I've been talking for far too long. Yeah. Well, just on that just on that point, I won't I won't name names and won't name location. But I one governor I got to know quite well had a policy of every morning, um, you know, he, the first thing you do is he walk around, and he sp he split the prison basically into five four or five walks. So every inmate or uh, officer knew that he would be on their wing one day of the week in the morning and he said yeah it takes a big chunk out of my day but when i get back to the office i haven't got a pile of memos and can you sort this out because they've all talked to him and he's just resolved it there and then and he said it was the it was the most efficient way and this was a major high security prison we're talking about he said it was a really efficient way to run the prison just by yeah. being on the ground for staff and inmates yeah, you see, I think this is the, 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 the nub of the issue, if I may. Um, got to be careful what I say when I'm talking to architectural experts, but a good prison, 
I mean, we've got too, far, far, far too many prisons, far too many prisoners. The whole system is cri crippled by overcrowding and excessive recourse to prisons compared with non-English speaking countries. Um, you just go to the Netherlands and see something quite different and, and much more um, progressive attitudes. Um, but it's really about running an institution and the relationship between the people in that institution. Um, and, and, and people did cope with the most appalling conditions, and sometimes they failed in the most basic, in, in really good conditions. And one thing that really impressed me about the USA was that you would actually find prisoners and staff eating the same food in shared dining rooms. Yeah. And that struck me as extremely human, extremely intelligent, and I also spent some time in the Treasury, um, very economical. Yeah. Um, but that, that's a sort of prison that when you're going to have prisons, when people are going to be in prisons, that's the kind of thing you want to see. Now, a lot of prisons, the Bullingdon prisons, were built with dining rooms, but they were never used because yeah. they were prisoners are expected to eat in cell. Yeah. And that was a great failure um, yeah. of management once the architecture was there. So I won't say any more. Sorry, I've been speaking okay, far too no, long. No, I, I, I can't find anything to disagree with what we've been saying. We'll perhaps catch up with you later. Bye. Well, you know where to find me at Historic England. I think we've we've probably given you more than a run for your money, Alan. And there is one no final uh, question, which will hopefully be a, a relatively short answer and sort of speaks really to the core work of, of, of Historic England. And that's whether any of these 20th century post-Victorian new prisons are listed, and whether there's any likelihood that any of them would be. Yeah, I, yeah, I think we're going to struggle. I think we would... Um, I don't like the phrase, but we pre we would we would indulge in a bit of preservation by recording. I think I don't think um, I don't think preserving twentieth century um, prison would would really fly. I don't. I you know I, I none of them are. Uh, one of the one of the criteria for a listing is obviously they've got to be substantially, um, particularly for a modern listing, they've got to be of the best sort of higher sort of quality and substantially intact well they've had cell doors replaced they've had windows replaced they've, you know so i i think we, we we would seek to preserve through sort of recording the buildings great well it remains only for me to thank you once again on on behalf of everyone here